If you're a Rock Under Fire listener who loves to read, if you like history and you don't mind politics with your rock and roll, it's all of the above. All the yet some controversy, the murder of John Lennon, the evolution of Bruce Springsteen and the birth of the Reagan era. It was 1980 and the climate was changing. Autumn and Everything After, a book by yours truly. Available everywhere books are sold, in soft cover editions, in ebook editions. Listen, fuckers, I have 19 kids to feed. I'm just trying to sell some books here. And it's a really good book. They're all named Mike. Even if you don't <laughs> like said people. All right, what's going on, Pat? What's going on this time? None. I was uh, thinking about your 19 children, all named Mike. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, I don't know, man. It's uh, you know, it, it's my older daughter's birthday, and uh, it, it always, while well, that's such a great day, it always reminds me of uh, the passing of Chris Cornell. This time of and, year, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know what a tremendous loss he he was to the to the rock community, man. Right. So I've been listening to a little bit of Audio Slave and Soundgarden. Getting my, getting my jam onto that. Well, I mean, the thing I texted you earlier in the week about was uh, that I wanted to talk about right at the outset was what we were talking about last time, the possible cancellation once again of some major tours. And the first thing, as soon as this week opened, the first thing I saw was that the stadium tour has been postponed once again. You mean the one where Motley Crue were never going to tour again? That one? That one, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I that remember one. now. Yeah. <laughs> we're never going to tour again. Holy shit, I need some money. Maybe you call the guys, we better tour again. My artsy fartsy elitist centric mind said swore never to make fun of these groups that they were doing a stadium tour, but the fact that they call it the stadium tour is just kind of like, oh, we're, we're playing a stadium. They, they had to take two other acts out they with them to, to do it. They had to take two or three other acts and jump yet. <laughs> <laughs> look i'll give motley crew their day but they're not filling the stadium on their own they're just not they're not the stones they're not bruce they're not pearl jam they're not you two uh, there's not many bands that can do it anymore there's just not no you know, definitely definitely under 10 De- definitely and under those, 10 acts and, and those few that can not only do they do not only do they sell out a stadium but I don't know, let's use Bruce as an example here. That guy sells out, you know, the Meadowlands three or four, five, six nights in a row, man. I mean, that's a hot ticket when he's in town. I just and, saw you know, the, the, the Stones, too. They, they do the same thing. Journey and Foo Fighters are now confirmed for um, Lollapalooza. I heard that on the radio today, actually. Happening um, July 29th through August 1st. What is it? How long has it been a four-day festival? How long and how long before they started having bands that was kind of like the anti what Lollapalooza was supposed to be about initially. Well, I think it's been a few years since they started doing it in, uh, in Chicago. I don't remember the name of the park, but since they started keeping it in Chicago, yeah. Yeah. I think they started doing three days, like a three, I don't know if it was four days, but I'm certain that it was two to three days that they, uh, they did a multiple, multiple day event there at the park. If I had How to guess, uh, five, eight years. Did it start as a tour? I, I, your guess is as good as mine. I always remembered it as a tour. Um, maybe it started in Chicago and then they went on the road with it. I, I, I don't know. the first year. With Jane's Addiction and Early maybe 90s. Henry Rollins was on that tour. My brother went to maybe the second or the third one. Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Chili Peppers. It was a mm-hmm. huge venue. I, Ice Cube. My brother said Ice Cube tore that place apart, bro. He said Ice Cube was amazing. I mean, he went to see Pearl Jam. That was like the whole reason why he went. Yeah. But uh, he said he said Ice Cube put on one hell of a show. That was one of Just, the first years, right? Yeah, it was. It's in the early. It was in the early years. Um, can you imagine those thousands of white kids just with their arms up and Ice Cube just leading the charge? You know what I mean? Well, that's <laughs> funny that you mentioned that. Man, because, well, how, what was their response to Ice Cube? My brother said the place went nuts. Right? 
Yeah. At that voice point, voice. man, it was just like the, the writing was on the wall that, you know, I mean, Rock's days were numbered as a, as a, as a mainstream entity. In, in, in those days, Ice Cube in particular was just coming, you know, he, he was out of NWA, um, had some really solid solo stuff. Dr. Dre was coming, was, was, was coming on strong. Right. Um, so that, that West Coast, that, that West Coast style of rap was really coming, like really hit hard. It was really yeah. popular. You know, all the, everything broke off of NWA because all those guys were NWA guys. And so once that, you know, you know, once that split and they split up and started going their own way, like hip hop took a really interesting turn at that point, you know, because there was these wars, you know, everybody hated Easy e Easy e hated them. It was just this, you know, they were poking and jabbing at everybody. And, yeah. And, you know, Compton was not like a safe place, you know, it was, it was craziness. It was a good time for rap music, though. It's interesting that you bring that up because it's we're going on 40 years next week. Starting next week will be part the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the clashes run at Bonds International Casino in New York City, right in Times Square. Bonds was like a dance club, but became a dance club. I mean, Bonds goes back to like you look at pictures from Times Square of the 1940s and you see Bonds. Right. But they were supposed to do eight shows. And because they oversold like thousands and thousands and thousands of tickets, I think the capacity was supposed to be 1,500. And they had like 3,500 people jammed in there the first night. The fire department came in and shut, shut that shit down. Wow. You know, so a lot of people were, you know, you know, so by the Saturday show, they had, they, back then they had matinees. So, Clash was doing an all ages show on a Saturday afternoon, which was supposed to be the third show. And then the night show was supposed to be the fourth show. And the police shut it down. So they had a riot in Times Square. So, I mean, this was like, this put the Clash, this is what basically brought the Clash into me, you know, superstar. Yeah. Uh, the Clash ended up uh, doing 17 shows to honor every ticket that was sold. So wow. they're like, we're going to have to keep this at a certain capacity. So everybody that got a ticket was then rescheduled to a certain date. And, you know, consequently, a lot of shows had to get canceled. And a lot of promoters and managers had to agree that they were going to let the Clash play for another three weeks. <laughs> so nuts. Yeah. So um, the, the point in bringing that up in, in, in uh, to speak to Ice Cube playing, doing those shows, is that they had Grandmaster Flash as their opening act on the oh, first, wow. you know, uh, the first night, and they they threw shit at him, man. They threw bottles at him. They booed him. They, you know, I mean, they completely fucking abused those guys, man. I, I you know, it's funny. I just watched a documentary on uh, on Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime, about the history of Thrash and Alice in Chains ended up on a tour with like anthrax and, and maybe slayer or, or it was this crazy thing where i think overkill had to back out so they brought in alice in chains and yeah it was, it was definitely anthrax because scott ian was like you know i gotta give it to these fucking guys they were not fresh and they were just fucking hated yet night after night after fucking night they went out there and played their shit and played their set and, you know, Scott Ian became very good friends with Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains, like, during that period. And um, he goes, I used to sit from the sidelines and just watch these guys get fucking booed with beer bottles thrown at them. And he goes, but they did their fucking thing, man. And he goes, and, you know, now look at what Alice in Chains have become. You know, they, they yeah. talk about cutting your teeth. That's a tough fucking crowd to cut your teeth on, a thrash crowd. Or in this case, Ice Cube cutting his teeth on a, a, uh, on a, a grunge, uh, on a grunge crowd. That was that. It, that was just still back in the eighties. Yeah, Obviously, just before the bro. just just before they broke. So you're looking at maybe eighty nine. That's could be, that's could be later. Okay, wait, wait, I, I marked some stuff down here, man. I got to read some of this. Oh, you were saying something about Led. You were watching Led Zeppelin's. Uh, oh, I was listening oh, to that. Was, yeah, the Atlantic. The Atlantic. Uh, 40th anniversary of Atlantic or something. 
from 1988. Yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that was um, Carol Miller on 104.3 here in, in our area in New York. She does this thing every night called Get the Lead Out at 8 o'clock. Does she still and do I'm, that? Yeah, every, every, every day. But on Monday, they call it Get the Lead Out XL or something. So it's an hour long of Zeppelin, and they spotlight a lot of different things. Like one year or one week they did um, the cover – <clears throat> the Coverdale page uh, project. They, they talked extensively about that and had interviews with Coverdale, interviews with Page about that whole record, um, which I think is a little underrated, obviously. Actually, I, I, I enjoyed it. But um, last week, I believe it was, was that 40th anniversary of Atlantic, uh, of Atlantic Records. And I, I think that that was the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, that Zeppelin had gotten back together to to play a live show no because, it was the second time because they all oh, right they live had, aid you had live aid, live aid right. was a fucking disaster right and, and, they, right and then they got together three years later right um um but the thing uh, live, jason okay, live aid, they had so right and, and the, the difference in atlantic was that they had jason yeah, and right. um right and the, the cool thing about it was john paul jones in an interview was talking because carol plays some of those interviews uh, some of the interviews was saying that uh, John Paul Jones was saying that Jason knew everything. Like he goes, oh, well, in 75, you guys did this and you rolled right into that and you played it like this. And he just like, and, he, and John Paul Jones said it was just such a comfort to have that kid, who he was, obviously, but to have, have all that knowledge that, you know, that we had probably forgotten. And he was just so forward with it and, and, and he just, he, you know, he like lit a fire under the guys more or less. And, and it, it sounded just absolutely phenomenal. It, you know, Robert sounded terrific. They, they were tight. They got to, re- you, you could tell that they got to rehearse. It wasn't Phil Collins flying across the Atlantic on a Concorde to just jump into drums with them and play with another drummer and half ass it. It just wasn't that. It was, it was definitely special. All that for the starving <laughs> people of, of Ethiopia. To show that you can get on a fucking jet and fly across the Atlantic and stay in two different places. Yeah, that's how, something else. How noble of Phil Collins, man. But I mean, sometimes <laughs> it's, it's really like, it actually helps a lot of these bands to have that younger blood in the band that even if it's a family member, if it's not a family, family member, it could be a fan, you know, that can sit there and dictate the band's history and say, look, you did this, 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 and this, and even breathe some, some fresh into the group we've seen that numerous times you know uh um richie faulkner you know and judas priest Mm -hmm. just getting getting these guys ian and rob ian hill and rob halford to to dig through their past catalog and pull up these old chestnuts of songs that they haven't touched uh sometimes ever just to get a, a fan's perspective on what some some fans would really love to hear um, I remember watching that Atlantic show very shortly after it happened. I don't know, I don't, maybe HBO showed it. And I don't remember a I, damn thing about it. I remember it being better than Live Aid. Yeah, well, <laughs> like you said, it was a disaster. Live Aid was a fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah. And it was probably, it was probably, aside from Queen, it was probably one of the most anticipated performances of that whole Live Aid uh, show. Yeah. It, it really was, man. Yeah. That was probably it. That was like everybody in this, you know, at, at least in Philly, were waiting to see Zeppelin. Maybe, maybe oh, yeah. in, in London it was the Who. You um, know? Queen. I, I mean, I you know, it seemed like Queen. Looking back on it now, it seemed like Queen was a big draw because they hadn't even played. Historically, and, Queen uh, turned out to be the biggest act yeah. that day. That them and U two. You know, I mean, U two. U two walked on stage a very respected cult act and they walked off the biggest band in the world. Yeah. They you know? walked off superstars. Yeah. That's a good and, call. Um, uh, uh, Queen historically, you know, later on with the movie, I mean, that really raised, you know, and, and it really was the best. Show. I think it was the best show that day. Queen. Madonna, you know, Live Aid Madonna blew up after that too. Yeah. That was her uh, at it. summer. I mean, she was five. She was a superstar, yeah. I mean, but she was 
she was definitely on. What the hell just happened? Your camera went off. Yeah, okay, there it is. Right. She was definitely on her way to. I hit the wrong button. She was definitely on her way to uh, to start. We, we that even kind turn of our like cameras off, and we still record. I'm sorry, but yeah, no, no, that's all good. That just like kind of propelled her. Because I remember this a couple of months before Live Aid, Madonna had. Um, she started that. I guess I don't know what was it. The Virgin tour. The Virgin tour. She had, she played like multiple dates at the Garden and Radio City with the Beastie Boys opening up. Yep. You know, and um, so she had already. That was probably her biggest audience up at that point. Yeah. You at know? that point. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, it was a huge event. I mean, it, regard it, besides everybody that was there. I mean, that thing was like nationally televised, and it was just the media outlets. And it was that was a hell of an event. <clears throat> it had its it had its misfires, but I mean, you know. <laughs> Speaking of the eighties, Duran Duran have their first new album in about six years. Oh, really? With um, Giorgio Moroder and uh, Licky Lee, who is uh, one of I think one of the better, she's, she's a Swedish singer, songwriter, artist. Uh, I was really into her first record. Uh, this is their 15th album. It's called Future Past, Duran Duran. It's, uh, it's not expected until October 22nd. The first single is out now. It's called Invisible. This is the model. This is the new model for releasing music today, man. This is... Go ahead. We've you got to finish that point. Man. But you know, yeah. it, you know, when when a new album was coming out, you you know, you'd hear about it, you'd read about it, you'd have to go out to your local pharmacy and look at Hit Parade or a Circus or something like that, or Rolling Stone, and then after maybe about three weeks to a month after the initial announcement of a record, you'd get the first single, and then there'd be a forty-five out there, or maybe a cassette single. Followed three weeks later by the full record, right? That was always the marketing model. Announcement very shortly after the first single, and then within a three weeks to a month, the latest, the new product, the full new album, right? Now the model is announce the album five months ahead of time, and then have five months worth of singles. And by the time the album comes out, half the fucking album has been released as singles. That's been the new model. <laughs> if you notice that, I don't know if you notice right, well, that, especially with streaming. I don't, know if they, I don't know if they notice single after single after single, but I have noticed that they release music. And then, like you said, the, the, the album's not due for like another five months. Rock and roll whole thing. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let, me get, let me get the tums. Get the metal heads collectively, get them together and bang their fucking heads together while while we're at this. Because everybody that's rightfully pissed about Iron Maiden not making it is is is, you know, yeah. We mentioned Judas Priest. Judas Priest has now been snubbed for almost twice the amount of time that Kiss was. And we cannot put Iron Maiden in a, in a Hall of Fame that Judas Priest is involved in. Can we? No. I'll, I'll agree with you on that. I like Iron Maiden better, but I'll, I'll give you that. I, I, and, and yeah, you know I, what? Arguably, Iron Maiden has been far more successful than Priest ever was. I mean, far more successful globally. Um, longevity wise, the ability to sell out arenas and stadiums all over the world 40 years later. Fucking impressive. <laughs> Iron Maiden is Iron Maiden is the shit, man. But in terms of chronological and influential importance, man, you gotta to go. put Judas Priest in there first, man. I agree. And so be patient. Everybody gets in there eventually. Not without uproar. Yeah. And you remember, I mean, we're dealing with politics. We're always dealing with politics. As long as certain people are still around, 
certain groups are not going to get in. But, you know, here's the thing. It's, it's, it's basically no different than the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's a fucking popularity contest is all it is. This is true. Um, you know, there are some degenerates in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Flat out racist, degenerate drunks in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Pete Rose is not in the Hall of Fame. The all-time hits leader is not in the Hall of Fame. Um, a guy like let's uh, let's Ken Griffey Jr. How's he not unanimously voted? Who was the one fucking guy who didn't vote him into the Hall of Fame? Uh, who did that? I don't know. You, you don't, who who does that? The the guy Griffey was arguably one of the best base, baseball players in his era. Mm. And he, he didn't get in unanimously. Mariano Rivera did. He was the first guy to do it. <coughs> and, you know, okay, rightly so. Um, I, I don't want to use Jeter there because I'm kind of biased. I'm a Yankee fan, so I can't use Jeter there. So it's, it's a popularity contest is really all it is. And these writers, you know, these baseball writers in particular, you can't even – the guy can't even shag a fly ball, and he gets to determine who's in the Hall of Fame and who's not. That irk, that irks me. Same with metal. That's, that's the case with everything. That's the case with yeah. everything. With the, with the, yeah, I see your point. So, so I just wanted to drill it down a little bit more because you said the politics and you hit it right on the head. So I just wanted to drill in there a little bit more because these music writers, well, you know, I mean, when, when do they fucking get it right? They, they, I'm going to take a guy like Beck who was, he, he's okay. Okay. I, I could deal with Beck. He's all right. Is Beck, but, did Beck get in? Is he in? I don't, I, he... I don't know. I, I, don't I don't even know. I don't think he's in no, yet. I, I doubt it. I'm just using him as an example here for writers. He is a critic's darling. Sure. When Beck has a new record come out, it's holy shit, let's pump the brakes. Beck's got a record coming out. Let's. I saw that guy on Saturday Night Live. I'm like, what in the fuck am I watching right here? What is this? Did this guy... He has some good music. But the critics make it sound like he's the next fucking Bob Dylan, for Christ's sakes. I'm like, are you out of your mind? I just don't get it. So so until we until we get real people in there to really vote on bands that should or should not make it, it's just always going to be the same argument year after year. I just think it's the elitist mentality against metal that don't see metal as a as a legitimate art form. You know, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the plain truth, man. It's the, it's the baby boom generation's elitist mentality, man, that kind of looks down on certain things like metal. It's too lowbrow for them. You know what I mean? And um, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that happening, man. And, and you know, look, thankfully, people like Tom Morello have now yeah. entered, entered the, the hall in terms of being you know, voting and, you know, younger generation artists who are respected by these baby boom critics who people like Morello have said, listen, you got to put the kids in there. Yeah. You got to put Rush in there. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and they're, they're listening. They are listening slowly, but surely, man, they're listening. Yeah. They know, they know their generation fucked up by, by, you know, you rock and roll doesn't begin and end with the baby boomers, man. It, it's in their eyes, maybe they thought that, that was going to be it, you know, and that it was going to last forever with them. But it stops at some point. At some point, it fucking stops. You either keep pushing forward or more rap artists get in. You can't have it both I've, ways. I'm on record to say this. Um, I you, I love hip hop. You know that. Everybody who knows me knows that. But that's not rock and roll, man. It's not. You want to have a hip hop Hall of Fame? Every single one of those artists should be in there. Every single one, and then some. But I, they're just they're not rock and roll. It it, it it's completely two different. Completely, it, it, I don't know, man. It's oh. even some of the R and B artists. I just I, I don't grasp that. I don't. I'm not going to agree or disagree with you on that, man. I think I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to come to, I'm trying to come to terms with that idea, man. And trying to I, there's a much wider conversation we had, like we we should really do an episode on that. I kind of 
begs the question, well, what is rock and roll? What is rock and roll? You know, and it's, a, yeah, it's but, not a question to answer now. I'm just saying that these are these are questions. Uh, there's much bigger questions, you know, and I'm trying to would come you, to terms with, you know, how how do we. I think it can be justified that Grandmaster Flash is in the rock and roll, you know, but it, it's it's. Are you are you running much, out to grab? Are you are you running out to grab the new rock record by Jay Z? No, okay. no, but I think. It, are you running out to Are you running out to buy the new hip hop record from Jay Z? Yeah, um, I probably well, will. Well, I mean, I probably it, will. I think it. I think it's something that we're putting like a time limit on rock on rock music. You know, um, I mean, Bob Dylan. You mentioned Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, in Bob Dylan's opinion, rock and roll died in 1959. Okay. You know, like rock and roll. If you, th if you think about rock and roll, rock around the clock, jailhouse rock. You know, yeah. the, you know the original rock and roll sound, man. Which was, you know, which basically later became they just called rock, because there, you know, there is no rock and roll music in Judas Priest. You know, there's no, you know, like at there's, some point just, Judas, when Judas Priest was fresh, they got they got rid of the blues. There's no blues in Painkiller. You know, but there's, there's no, <laughs> no, but there's but the structure no I think is, player, I, but I, I think the structure is still there. Um, it's 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 just it, it became a different thing. So I think I think what happens is. As Maybe time goes on, man, you know, it just kind of evolves into different things, man. Is race hip hop rock? No, it's not rock. At some point, do they stop calling it the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and call it the Music Hall of Fame? Do Great they call point. It, do they call it the Pop Music Hall of Fame? You know, at some point, people didn't consider Picasso in the Cubists. Cubism art. They said, well, that's not art. You know, that's not painting. That's not showing nude figures. This is just a bunch of shapes. Like, you know, at what point did they did they were they supposed to stop calling it art? Did they call it, would it be something easier, else? It would be easier for me to swallow if it were the Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. That was a great it, point. That it was might an be, absolutely phenomenal point. It might be something that is just going to evolve, you know, because, again, if you go into an art museum, you're going to see all kinds of art. You're gonna you're gonna see Egyptian art. You're gonna see Chinese art. You see, I mean, you can see yeah. Asian art in general. You know, Japanese, Indian, um, Chinese, Tibetan. You know, you're gonna see all kinds of stuff. You're gonna go on the other side, man. You're gonna see European paintings, man. You're gonna go in the back. You're gonna see medieval sculpture, and you're gonna see all kinds. You're gonna see contemporary stuff. You're gonna see you see stuff from the 20th century, and, and all kind of. It's this big conglomeration of historical periods. And I see the same thing happening with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, okay, I'm all right with that. Like, you know, disco is a flavor of <clears throat> maybe not rock and roll, but maybe maybe this just the idea, the problem is, is that we call it the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think that it was like a, it should have been like a trial and error thing because people, again, it's the baby boomers celebrating themselves, man. <laughs> you know, and it, yeah. they thought it was it's like be all end all. You know, okay, we're going to start this thing, and we're going to honor our forefathers. We're going to honor Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis and Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley and Carl Perkins and all these people. You know, and Johnny Cash and 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 all these people that came before us, and then even the people that came before them. You know, Robert Johnson and 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 Muddy Waters. And, you know, and and the, and the blues artists. But at some point, it's going to stop. And nobody after us deserves to get in. Man. That's, that's the attitude. That's the attitude, man. And that's where they fucked up. They thought that there was going to be this endless supply of baby boomer artists, man. Yeah, well. And that's really where they, they, they really didn't consider that it's not going to last forever, man. At some point, different decades happen. The 80s happened. The 90s happened. The 2000s happened. The 2010s happened. Now we're in the fucking 20s again. Yeah. The roaring fucking 20s. And here we are, man. And all this time worth of music is past, man. And nobody from that generation seems to think any of the last 30 years is worthy of getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yep. And these are not any concrete opinions of mine. This is not what I think. This is just, I'm just putting these possibilities out there. That you know maybe maybe what they need to do in the future is just call it the music hall of fame, 
or the I don't disagree with that. Hall of Fame or something like that. I don't know. But if you're if you're having a rock and roll Hall of Fame, man, and Jay Z is going to get into something that Judas Priest is not in yet, then there's a problem. Then I totally 100% agree with you. Yeah. It's about money. Money, oh, money, money, too. money, man. What's going to bring people to their museum? What's the demographic? What demographic are they chasing? Yeah. They need to bring people to their museum. At some point, they said, look, it's going to be more interesting if Kiss is in your, in your museum. It's going to be more interesting if Jay-Z is in your museum. And, you know, people are going to come to see Jay-Z in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, man. To be a different demographic, man, but they don't, it's money. It's money coming through their doors. They got to pay their employees. You know, it's, it's all about money. No matter what the fucking subject is, man, it all comes down to money. Yeah, you know? I agree. By speaking of Bob Dylan, by the time this episode airs on Monday, the 24th, Bob Dylan will have turned 80. This is uh this is a freaking thought, man. Maybe we'll end on this. <clears throat> have you seen that? Uh... Jay Lustig is doing a song, a song a day from the Dylan records. I think that's really cool. I, I love that little piece that he does. Ooh. He did Stevie Wonder, Jay Lustig. Oh, Jay, Jay from yeah. NJ, NJR. NJR. Net. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he did that Stevie Wonder. Is, that guy must never sleep, man. <laughs> he posts a lot. He's, he's that very guy, active. I mean, he's he can't have a big budget, man. You know, because he writes, him and another guy write basically everything, man. You know, I give that guy all the credit in the world, man. He just, he just, he's just tireless, man. He just keeps going and he's just like never without content, man. Um, it's always very good. Ta- it's always very good content, too. Even if I don't <laughs> agree, or, I, I still read it through and I'm like, man, it's just. It's but well he keeps his out. social well media made. going too, man. That's yeah. the thing. Like he's just like he's he's just as like tireless in his social media. I, I haven't seen what he's posted recently, man, because I don't go on that much. Um, he's very active. He's always very active. I saw what he did with um, Elvis Costello, where he did an album a day or a song, a song a day from the a, album a, a day. Song, yeah, a song a day from his albums. He did that with Dylan. He did it with Stevie Wonder. Um, I think I'm missing somebody. I tried to get him to do Pearl Jam. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, shit. Oh, uh, the Stevie Wonder one was great. I mean, it, it, he picked some. Uh, you know, you go back into Stevie Wonder's catalog. You know, like, Jesus he Christ, doing... he started when he was like 15 or whatever it was. I know, man. He was so... already a legend by the time Talking Book came out. That's go figure, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Think, think that about that. He's 21 years old, man. Yeah, he's about to and he's a legend. His first real album masterpiece, man, but he was already a legend. Yeah. You know? That was like... Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Bob Dylan's turning 80, man. 80. I mean, look, I mean it's, it's like we're, our rock stars weren't supposed to get old. We were, I mean, we remember when we were growing up, our rock stars were in their 30s. We were in our teens, they were in their 30s, and they seemed old. Then they got if into they made, their 40s and 50s, man. If, if, if they made it to 30. Yeah, that fateful that fateful twenty seven. He's done. I mean, he's done some of his most vital work in the last twenty years. That's the thing, you know. I remember when he turned sixty, and since then, man, he's put out three or four of his his best albums. And he's done a lot. You know, I mean, the guy is still relevant and vital, man. And you know, I mean, guys like you know Tony Bennett, who has performed well after his eighties. Guys like Frankie Valley, who's performing well into his 80s. You know, even Sinatra. Sinatra didn't perform past his 70s. He didn't perform into his 80s. You know, there's yeah. Tony Bennett, there's Frankie Valley. I don't know who else there is. But there's Chuck, Bob Chuck Dylan. Barry. You know, Chuck um, Berry did it. Chuck Berry. B.B. King, I think he was another one, right? Didn't B.B. play into his 70s? Yeah. Or was he 80? But I guess I'm more to my point name. was that uh, he's he's continued to write. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, he's turning out vital work that's just as I mean relevant to the stuff going on today. You know, I mean, murder most foul, rough and rowdy ways, which came out last year. He's not sitting with his own death and more, you know, mortality. He's definitely sitting with uh, 
America's, if not both. Hey, hey when I'm 80, I, I just want my brain not to be a fucking bowl of warm oatmeal. I, I mean, and this guy's writing stuff that is yeah. relevant. I, I get yeah. it. He's at not this sitting point, in it's bed just drooling kind of, in his lap. Where it's looking like things are slowly opening back up. We're we're getting words of of tours being postponed, shows being postponed, um, and at the same time, dates continue to be announced for other tours. So mm -hmm. uh, by the time, I mean, we're a biweekly podcast. We're doing shows again. We're in this new new season of uh, of episodes, and uh, by the time we we regroup again, who knows what's going to be canceled? Who knows what's going to be announced? It's going to be an interesting few months. Venues going back to full capacity. Radio City Music, Music Hall just announced today that they're going back to full capacity in June. And that answers hmm. our question from last time. Uh, yeah, you've got to be fully vaccinated for that. That's, that's Sport, going to be pretty interesting. Sports venues are having, you know, they're getting closer and closer to, uh, I think in Utah, man, I was at the Utah Jazz, man, are having 57 Hundred people into their into their arena for their playoff game on Saturday. Playoff, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just gotta watch the Lakers at ten, man. <laughs> Lakers game. I'll be sleeping. I'll be sleeping. <laughs> um, I hope the, I hope the Lakers lose because I really don't like LeBron James. I don't like the Golden State Warriors. Fair enough. I'm not digging this playing tournament, man. I don't I don't like the idea of it. I think it's stupid. It's interesting. It's interesting as hell. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just I'm just mathematically stupid, or I just don't understand what the purpose of it is, man. But this idea to find who the seventh and eighth seed is, why don't they just go with who came in seventh and eighth? <laughs> hey, I always cut out the ninth and tenth team. I, I love I love winning your in games. I love them from football, baseball, basketball. I don't care where they come from. Winning your in, sign me up. Mm -hmm.